Now, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you, Stephen, because uh, I think I'm the only one that has connected these dots, which I'm about to articulate. And that is this. The range case out of the Third Circuit, and just to remind everyone, in the Range versus the United States case, Brian Range brought a lawsuit saying that he should not be denied his right to keep and bear arms for life because 20 years ago, he alleged he lied and pled guilty to a state misdemeanor that he went to get food stamps and failed to disclose like his lawn mowing income. He was found guilty of a misdemeanor, but because under that Pennsylvania misdemeanor statute, he theoretically under the law could have gone to prison for over two years. That technically is a felony by definition under 922 G1. Yes. Even though Mr. Range, I don't think served a day never, in prison. Yeah, he never served any jail time. Not I think a it was like day. a, a $3,000 fine, I believe. Exactly right. So the Third Circuit on Bach came out with a very powerful ruling. This is Mr. Range gets his gun rights back that this is he's not dangerous. That is the key. And he's not dangerous. The government didn't even try, couldn't even show it. And therefore, so here's the interesting thing that could happen. And that is I could see a situation where the Supreme Court grants cert later this year to the Range case and decides the Range case and the Rahimi case. And again, this is getting super geeky here, but I could see a situation where this, the Supreme Court lays out the real Second Amendment standards of dangerousness versus the anti-gunner view of virtuousness, right? If you don't respect the law because you don't recycle properly, we get to take your, your gun rights, which is the view of the anti-gun movement, by the way. So that notion, I could see the range case resolving the substantive Second Amendment question, while the Rahimi case may focus on the procedural process by which the government must follow to take away one Second Amendment substantive rights. Now, again, am I saying this is 100% going to happen? I'm not, but I'm saying there's a lot more moving parts here. And a lot of this could be bad for the anti-gun movement because there's a lot of legal questions that have arisen in the last 12 months since Bruin that the Supreme Court may very well wind up cleaning up. So, for example, the anti-gunners work really hard trying to say that in the definition of the people, as in the right of the people to keep in their arms, they try to add the words, the modifying words of law abiding. So what the anti-gunners are arguing in court, by and large, as I can tell, is that the people that are protected are only those that are law abiding. But that's not what the Supreme Court said in Heller. The, the Supreme Court says that all the people in the United States have the right to keep in their arms. And you can only take those away by virtue of looking at historical legal analogs. But the anti-gunners are trying to conflate this. And this is going to be an opportunity for the Supreme Court, for example, to take some of these arguments being advanced in court against the Second Amendment and clean some of these items up, which is why it's a very risky move what Merrick Garland has done here. It may work. It may somehow undercut the Bruin methodology, but boy, it may backfire entirely and allow for the Supreme Court to clean up a lot of these open questions we've seen in the last year in these various cases across the country and fix it up and strengthen the Bruin methodology. And I could see that happening just as easily as it going the other way. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, certainly the Supreme Court has kind of created some of these issues in and of themselves. I mean, the way that the way that they are constantly referring to law abiding in a lot of the dicta or references to um, you know, longstanding traditions without explaining using the history and tradition method, how they got to the conclusion that things like felon in possession uh, bans or machine gun bans are longstanding. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot there. I mean, look, to be fair, the Supreme Court, this is only the seventh case they've ever taken on the Second Amendment, right? Yeah. Uh, and one of those got And they muted. haven't needed to. The truth is there was no need for anyone to really get into the Second Amendment until the anti, you know, until people really started trying to go after gun rights. I mean, set aside the 1930s, which, you know, we can talk about, but really, you really see the anti-gun movement in the United States really laser focused trying to actually take away gun rights starting really in the 60s. And that's why when people say, well, why wasn't there Second Amendment law? Blah, blah earlier because the answer was there wasn't needed to. Everyone understood it was an individual right. You can go back to September of 1941, for example, where Congress, right before Pearl Harbor, literally is putting into law that all these requisition acts uh, where you can take an automotive plant and convert it into a tank plant or a cafeteria for teachers and convert it into a cafeteria for soldiers, literally in the law, the Requisition Act of September of, of 1941, they literally exempt the right to keep and bear arms. You cannot take people's 
arms away. And that's the Congress in 41. So any suggestion that this was anything other than individual right was never really in dispute until, again, we get into the 60s and 70s and the progressives really start taking over college campuses. And we know all the craziness uh, that has occurred since then in all aspects of American life, uh, not just the right to, to keep and bear arms.